welcome. I don't know that we want to wait longer for a bigger crowd. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, I don't know. Well, we can't see them anyway. You, you can see them anyway. Okay, the room <laughs> is filled with an exciting, roaring crowd uh, that I will struggle to keep quiet. And I hope they're all here to hear about you talking about Rust calling into ICU so that Fuchsia and other things can do internationalization. And maybe you can briefly introduce yourselves and then we get going. Sure. And okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Konstantin Posen, and this is. Uh, this is Philip. Yes, uh, we both work at Google on the Fuchsia team, and we are presenting Rust ICU, a collection of Rust crates or libraries that provide Rust language bindings for IC4C. Uh, IC4C is a C and C implementation of various Unicode related algorithms many of which you likely have seen if you attend this conference. Um, and uh, Rust ICU intends to make that library accessible from programs written in the Rust programming language. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to show you our work that makes the functionality of ICU available to programs written in Rust. So if you have a need to process international text, and you want to use Rust for its favorable system development properties, you may want to use our library. So why would you want to do this this way? So for one, ICU is a de facto standard library for working with internationalized text. So we made it usable in Rust and uh, this is available for use today. So many of the things that you may want to use are just available and ready for you today. And uh, if it turns out that some functionality that you need is currently not, it's very easy to contribute. And in this presentation, we'll briefly show you how you can do that. So not to be confused with ICU4X, because a few related projects have been spun up around processing international text in Rust specifically. And one we would like to point out is a sibling library that's also written in Rust. Uh, it is worth mentioning that a few Rust implementation of many algorithms is available through uh, the IC4X library. Uh, this library is under development and uh, looking for early adopters. It is the future of client-side Unicode support in Rust and other runtimes. So it is a native Rust library written from scratch. It offers support for multiple runtimes uh, and it's looking for early adopters. So this is something that you may also want to look at when you're evaluating what your options are. Uh, we produced Rust ICU because we had a set of very specific requirements, which uh, we will discuss in a moment. So why did we make Rust ICU? Well, we work on Fuchsia and uh, Fuchsia already uses ICU for C uh, the library in several runtimes, in Chromium, Flutter, and in many regular ELF executables, both in the main feature tree and outside. And we don't want to have the same logic and data represented in many different ways across different libraries. Um, and that's because Fuchsia has uh, a file system called BlobFS, which is content-based and can deduplicate identical files. So if you worked with ICU, the library, um, you might have encountered a big data file called icudtl.dat. Um, Fuchsia can deduplicate that if you have multiple copies. And if we're using shared libraries, so shared objects, then that can be deduplicated as well. And as you know, in an OS setting, judicious reuse of widely shared libraries is a good practice. And we have a few notes about Fuchsia, the operating system. So this is not a presentation about Fuchsia. So uh, we won't go into too much detail here, but uh, those of you who are interested, feel free to visit the URL noted in the slide. So Fuchsia is an open source effort to create a production grade operating system that prioritizes security, updatability, and performance. 
the core set of architectural principles are to be secure, updatable, inclusive, and pragmatic. And those uh, guide future design and development. So as Konstantin said, a lot of subsystems in the future are C++ programs. So they already use ICU in some form. So Rust has gained ground in future source code over time. And we already have applications that handle international text that are written in Rust. So reusing the same libraries allowed us not to expand the dependency footprint. So in a sense, the incremental cost of supporting Unicode text handling to ICU for us, given that ICU is already in use, is uh, fairly low. As an added benefit, uh, all those subsystems use the same library version, uh, which means whatever happens, uh, we will be showing consistent results across those runtimes. So for example, we are very careful to ensure that all clocks show the same time, uh, regardless of what runtime is powering them. Whether they are C++ or Rust or uh, Flutter, uh, to give a few, uh, a few examples. So, um, you know, if people usually care that their alarms fire at the correct time, and that their clocks uh, show consistent readings. So ICU time zone information feeds into all of them and ensures that they are uh, displayed properly and consistently. So another shoulder that we're standing on is, of course, uh, the Rust programming language. It is worth noting uh, how its use helps our, uh, our daily work and improves the quality of the code we write. So it inhabits the systems programming space which has for decades been dominated by C and uh, C++. So it solves uh, a number of problems around memory safety that plague C++ programs without introducing additional complications, which is a big deal. Um, it is possible to write performant but safe code in Rust, which is one of the biggest benefits that we have seen in our daily work. It is uh, easy to interoperate Rust code uh, with C code, allowing easy creation of cross-language bindings. And that works both ways. So for us, it means that there is a relatively low bar for reusing the code that's already there. And uh, that the integration is relatively speaking uncomplicated. So contrasting this to how foreign function interface works in languages like Python, Java, or Go, uh, to name a few. So this uh, made Rust ICU a worthwhile project. So in summary, uh, the requirements that guided our decision uh, to make and release Rust ICU are as follows. So we had a need for international tax handling. Uh, we uh, are and we were using Rust as the interfacing language and we were specific, specifically aiming for consistency across runtimes. At the outset of the project, uh, we looked at a number of alternatives and they're all listed here for completeness uh, on the left-hand side of the slide. So our project being open source among other things mean that we're easily able to uh, make use of the existing body of work and crucially also that we can contribute back our work uh, to where it is more generally uh, applicable. So what we uh, found uh, were the issues with existing solutions, uh, again, shown on the left-hand side of the slide, are some of them are no longer being actively supported. Uh, we have found that others require uh, static linking of CLDR data, for example, uh, meaning that there uh, is duplication and potential for version drift in our particular setup. And given the lack of support, uh, we were not certain about uh, the future evolution of those. Um, some of them were not directly applicable uh, outside of Rust, which didn't mesh uh, well with our incentive to reuse existing libraries. And in the end, uh, it wasn't easy or not obvious how to contribute or if we decide to follow that, uh, that route. Uh, I wanna point out uh, 
the uh, good news about uh, the other uh, other sibling library ICU4X here, which is shown on the right hand of this uh, of the slide. It has made tremendous progress over time, and will be probably the answer to international sex handling for the near future. So uh, its core is written in Rust and then linked into other languages, which is uh, a similar related uh, approach and it's uh, very neat and offers a growing feature set with a stable release plan for the first half of uh, 2022. Uh, there was uh, an ICU4X talk earlier on the same conference I hope you attended or that if this, this motivates you, you would go and look at the replay after. So it is important to emphasize that ICU4X didn't exist when we set off uh, to do this and it has made tremendous progress since then. So it kind of changes uh, your uh, calculation if you're deciding what, would, what you would be using today. And one interesting tidbit of history, the project, uh, the ICU4X, although not yet under that name, uh, had been kicked off at uh, this same conference about two years ago, 2019. Okay. So now we'll zoom in on the use cases for ICU and Fuchsia. How are we using it? Um, what, so there's functionality that we already had at the time the project was started, or we wanted to have shortly thereafter. So one example is language or script matching. So that's picking the best language or script based on the user's lang language preferences, matching up with what is available. So for app localization or for font selection. There's time zone calculations. We want to be able to support various wall clocks that applications on Fusion display. Uh, date and time formatting, also related, so for turning the real time clock information into human readable calendar strings. String localization, displaying user interface messages in the preferred language of a particular user. And uh, Unicode URL handling, uh, canonicalization of URLs, uh, that's important for our network stack. How are we approaching building ICU for C? Now, today there are other possible approaches that have opened up with more elaborate tooling. We'll talk about those later. But what we did is we started with the ICU for C library, so specifically the C parts of it, not the C parts. We used Rust Bindgen, which is a tool provided by the Rust project to generate low level Rust bindings to the C API. Then manually, we wrote and continue to write a slightly higher level Rust wrapper around the low level bindings. This wrapper provides Rust friendly essentials like using result and option types, handling object construction and destruction through the drop trait, conversions to and from standard Rust types and so on. And then we compile and link everything. So why didn't we use the C++ API that's in ICU for C? Um, that API, in some cases, offers better or different functionality than the C API, but Rust, Rust Bindgen does not have native C++ support, and manually writing Bindgen-friendly C wrappers around C++ objects and managing their lifetimes is uh, quite a feat. Right? We would have had to basically write C wrappers around all the C++ objects, keep track of their existence, destruction, memory, and so on, and then write uh, bindings from Rust into that C wrapper. So it would just been really messy. Um, also, the functions provided by C API were mostly sufficient for our purposes. And crucially, uh, the project called CXX was not yet available. CXX is uh, another open source project that provides, that lets you generate uh, two way bindings between C and Rust. Um, it hadn't launched yet when we started this project, but it is available now. So if you would like to contribute uh, C++ library support to Rust ICU, contributions are welcome. Uh, we had a few challenges to consider while we were developing Rust ICU. One was ease of use. Right? The API is fairly low level, but it still has to be reasonably user friendly. Ease of contribution. Uh, we decided to open source the resulting work, so it would be widely available. And we also decided to make it easy to contribute to the code because ICU4C has a huge API service, 
And practically speaking, we can't possibly implement all the wrappers on our own. We need your help. And another one was longevity. We want to make sure that the library will continue to work and be easy to update as newer versions of the underlying ICU libraries are released. So this is a uh, demo of what becomes of the C++ source code when it is passed to run Rust uh, tool bindgen. So bindgen will analyze the public API uh, that's listed in a C++ header and it is shown to the left-hand side of the slide and it will produce equivalent uh, declarations in Rust. So when viewed side by side like this, it should be obvious how the translation uh, works in broad strokes uh, because the uh, declarations across the languages are somewhat similar. So a nice property of Rust that it is uh, relatively speaking quite uncomplicated to take in a C API surface and make it part of your Rust library as long as it is properly declared. So this uh, should give you some idea about the result of running Rust bind gen on a C header from the ICU library. But of course this generalizes to uh, the rest of the API surface, which is of course too large to show on this slide, but uh, you will see on the right-hand side what what happens when when this uh, this is done. So the resulting C API is sadly not very uh, Rustful or uh, idiomatic for Rust. There's a lot of uh, handling mutable uh, pointers and sharing those, and generally what's called unsafe code in Rust. Uh, which is uh, usually not done there, especially when there are alternatives available. So in short, you simply get access to the underlying C API and from there you need to uh, connect the dots yourself. So in Rust, uh, we want to remove the need to deal with pointers directly and we want to clean up the life cycle of the uh, instantiated objects, uh, which are represented as these, uh, you know, as Rust called them, unsafe uh, functions. So next. So the ICO library has some unique quirks, uh, one of which is uh, function renaming. Uh, so the renaming is one of the options offered by the build script that we wrote that adapts the code so uh, this is uh, used to allow multiple major versions of a library to coexist uh, in the same binary. So sometimes this is a, a practical thing that one will need to use when, especially when linking large code bases, you might have different components pulling in the same library at different versions. So this ma just makes it possible for things to work. So how does it work? It's there's a, a series of defined directives in the uh, C code that will modify the symbol name to append the library major version number at the end of each symbol. So I've given, uh, we've given an example on the left hand side. So unum underscore parse function becomes unum underscore parse underscore 69, where 69 is the major library version in this case. So this meant that we also needed to uh, make the Rust language bindings to account for this discrepancy. And we wrote this uh, special adapter ma macro that can be seen on, on the right hand side. So it uh, is a conditional macro depending on a compile time feature that we'll discuss a bit later that allows the function to be invoked optionally with a version suffix or without one depending on what your environment requires. Uh, so uh, this shows a side-by-side -side view of uh, the C code that represents the uh, parts of this interface. And then the adaptations uh, that we needed to do for one of the fundamental types in the IC library called U enumeration. It shows some typical API adaptations that we had to make uh, for the binding to work reasonably in Rust. So for example, the free functions in C, uh, which take the target type are uh, represented by and large by methods defined on a type in Rust. 
Uh, this makes them easier to graph together because they will always go together as a package, although this is not a fundamental limitations and other such arrangements would be possible. And we still found this to be convenient. Um, in C, memory management is explicit, which means when you have when you allocate, you need to deallocate. In uh, the case of ICU, uh, you have a family of uh, functions that uh, end with underscore close, and all of these become uh, drop implementations with Rust, which you can see on the right hand side about the middle mid height of the of the listing, which is effectively a destructor. Uh, allowing us to stop worrying about correct memory management and kind of offload that to Rust. Uh, some sub APIs are reworked into APIs that behave better in Rust. So for example, uh, the count and next uh, pair of functions that you can see on the left um, are entirely converted into Rust iterators so that you can use this uh, familiar pattern in Rust uh, to uh, iterate over those types. So now we are looking at uh, a little bit uh, more uh, detail into the code, but since this is already getting a little bit verbose, this is about as detailed as it is going to get for the rest of the talk. Uh, this is an example of how a typical function is manually shimmed to remove the unsafety and adapt to Rust error handling. So most of the unsafe, or that is in this case C code, is fenced off in the unsafe block. You can see it on the right hand side, which basically involves um, <clears throat> correct invocation of a specific uh, C function through the Rust foreign uh, function interface. And then on either end, so on the left, like the preparations prior to the call, and then on the right at the end, uh, let's say the uh, exiting code after the C call has been made, pretty much adapts the types back and forth so that they are uh, attached together correctly and so that they adapt to the rest of the library as uh, a Rust library code would expect to happen. Um, another example of some adaptations that we've had to make. Um, if you look on the screen here, we have uh, examples of C functions from IC University Library uh, that all follow a similar pattern. What all these methods have in common is that you're trying to get a string answer. You guess the size of the buffer needed for the string and you pass in the buffer. I think that's called the pre-flight pattern in the library. And if you guess wrong, the error code is set to view buffer overflow error, and the return value of the function is the size of the actual buffer needed. And then you try again. Um, another complication is that the number of arguments before and after the buffer and buffer size arguments, the ones that are green and bold on the screen, uh, no, those numbers vary. Um, so these functions don't all look exactly the same, they just look similar to a human being. So we can generalize the creation of wrapper methods for this using Rust macros. So uh, the invocation um, looks like what you see on the left. You invoke it. Uh, actually, that's well, it's not uh, exactly an invocation. That, that's how we generate that that uh, function. So we uh, call buffered string method with retry, which is what we call this macro. Put in the name of the method, the initial guess for the capacity. And then the argument specifications for what goes before the two buffer arguments and what goes after the buffer arguments. And that gets translated into this method, which invokes the FFI method, and then um, calls all the arguments in, in the right place and returns a, a result with a string, and either a string or an error. And internally, it does all the retry logic of trying with one size of buffer, and then if that fails, getting, checking the error code and uh, trying again with a larger buffer if, if necessary. 
Okay. Uh, so uh, the library uh, supports a number of uh, configuration options, which just reflect the, the reality of using uh, Rust ICU in a large and relatively complicated code base. So we're going to uh, examine them uh, very briefly. Uh, those are, you know, compile uh, time configuration options act in a way similar to defines in C, but of course are somewhat more, uh, you know, more um, modern, if you will. Uh, we had to introduce a couple of them uh, to handle realistic situations. So for example, uh, uh, use bind gen is a feature that you are able to request at compile time that switches between uh, dynamically and statically generated code. Uh, this is, for example, to cater for specifically Fuchsia, which doesn't support uh, using generate co generated code. So we pre-generate and then reuse the library as such. And if your code base is similar, then you can just use that, that uh, canned approach without needing to reinvent your own. Uh, then there is a renaming uh, feature uh, which uh, indicates whether to turn off and on the function renaming. And we've seen previously, it would change the behavior of that version function macro uh, to do the correct thing by default. And then there is ICU config, which is whether to use the ICU config binary to discover the ICU location and build flags. Another is ICU version in environment, which uh, allows us to produce different tailor-made uh, versions of the library uh, depending on what uh, major ICU library version is actually in use in, in your code base. Uh, since we knew it would be hard for us to work through the entire API surface of the ICU library and provide the appropriate bindings, we decided to do something else. So I'll ask Constantine to show what happens here. So this is a demo of a contributor setup, which goes uh, almost from scratch. So you would, uh, you know, you need to have Git installed and you would Git clone uh, this open source project. Uh, just, you know, change the directory into there and provide that you have Docker installed, pretty much the rest goes automatically. Uh, we thought it would be important to show because it shows that if there is something that you're missing and you need to add, you would be able to add it relatively quickly. I don't think it's necessary to go through the entire somewhat lengthy compilation process and you know, feel free to fast forward a little bit. But the main point being, once this is done and it takes maybe a few minutes to do, uh, you would have a an environment that is ready to accept your contributions. So that I believe is important for lowering the barrier to entry and uh, making it more likely that uh, you would be able to change something that you need if you need it. So uh, there's that. Uh, and the contribution uh, process is pretty much standard and similar to uh, any other GitHub project. So this goes for a little while longer and if, uh, yeah, but in the end, it just ends up with a prompt and you're ready to fire up your editor, your ID of choice and proceed. So that's, that's basically that. Uh, so uh, we support the three most recent major versions of ICU uh, for longevity sake. Uh, this table shows uh, how the support evolved over time. Uh, you'll notice uh, that we have this exception and we keep supporting specifically ICU version 63. Uh, this is the ICU library version uh, that is required for long-term support because docs.rs, which uh, hosts the public documentation for the library, happens to use this one. But normally what we do is we keep uh, the compatibility with the last three versions. So that allows you uh, 
enough time to migrate if things change. Uh, this is a rundown of functionality available at uh, the version release uh, 1.0.0. Uh, the general guidance around when we released uh, 1.0 is, well, uh, we implemented all the functionality that we needed for Fuchsia. And then in addition to that, uh, we implemented the functionality that's needed uh, to be compatible with uh, the ECMA 402 standard, which allows you to swap in potentially other implementations as things evolve so that you have an upgrade path uh, regardless of what happens with this library in particular, you will see the functionality that is uh, provided today is uh, roughly divided into um, handling the ICU binary data, um, some low level and shared functionality, uh, locale sensitive list formatting, uh, locale support, uh, supporting a message format, which is uh, useful in uh, localizing the code, which we also use in Fuchsia, uh, support for formatting numbers, uh, for handling uh, different plural rules across uh, across languages, uh, and handling uh, Unicode strings and, and Unicode uh, text and transliteration. So uh, this approach is useful and has enabled us to go a long way, but there are limitations. So one important thing to note is that there isn't a guaranteed feature parity because as you've noticed, there's uh, manual work needed to ensure that functionality is in place. Also the, the practical bits are that in the ICU library, new C++ code is not always reflected in the C API. Uh, I will note that our experience has been that it was very easy to communicate with the maintainers of the ICU library and figure out the way forward, either, either by contributing code for the API support or by uh, asking nicely and actually getting uh, uh, someone to implement uh, the missing C API. So we also need to uh, keep a list of supported ICU versions as you know the uh, version drift happens over time and it needs manual attention uh, long term to ensure that everything uh, keeps on working. Uh, the bindings are manually curated. We uh, try our best to automate all that, but uh, where this is not possible, it kind of always reverts to us taking a look. We've built an, uh, quite a bit of automation around keeping uh, the automatable things uh, in order. and. An assumption is that the ICU API uh, changes relatively slowly, which for the ICU library is practically true. Uh, so that makes our life uh, somewhat easier. Well, let's, let's go on to the next slide. So this is, I would like to also show a screencast that demonstrates how a Fuchsia program is uh, using the library. So this is a demo that uses uh, the library to produce locale reports in format time in a few languages using different locales and different calendar. You'll see uh, me. Uh, Philip? Uh, oh, yes. Hi, this is Marcus. Um, the screen is not taking up the full projection screen here, so currently this is very hard to read from in the room. Um, oh, I don't know if you can blow it up enough, otherwise maybe just talk through it. Um, uh, sure. And also as a time check, we have 30 minutes left in a time slot. We typically leave five or 10 minutes for Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I think we are very close to uh, concluding this. This is, uh, so this is showing uh, how the ICU is embedded in uh, what would be a future program. So there's uh, some verbosity around how things are uh, being adapted, but you will see here, for example, a program that calls into the calendar and instantiates a time zone and calendar ID. Uh, all of this is open source code, so uh, it should be easy to 
uh, to find and inspect. So for whoever is interested, we'll be happy to provide the specific links if this is not quite readable on the screen. So this program will uh, take a number of locales and take a number of calendar, uh, calendar IDs and time zones and then instantiate the things. So uh, on the left-hand side, I'll just uh, quickly run it in a future-specific way. The exact method is not important. What is worth noting is how the um, output looks. And you will see that there are different languages and different calendars. This is all handled by the ICU instead of shunted through the ICU library. Okay, thank you very much. We'll uh, uh, move on to the next, next slide. So of course, for a library user, one concern is how long live the library is going to be. Like even with the open source projects, we need attention to keep them with the time. And this is yet another place where the project ICU for X comes into play. So if you're a user that wants the functionality, but unsure if you can commit to a future project in this way, uh, we provide an ECMA 402 compatibility layer. Uh, so uh, the idea is we define a set of interface interfaces that any library may implement and then implement fairly cheaply. So if the time comes for a migration, the migration is limited to implementing the needed interface. And in general, this sort of interface is a hard sell, but we are lucky because this work had already been done. So ECMA International published a standard, which is now in its seventh edition, uh, that uh, singles out a number of often needed pieces of functionality uh, for uh, working with uh, international client-side code. This is originally written for JavaScript, but it is standardized and it is well known and widely used. So the, uh, our idea was we'll, we'll provide an implementation of this standard uh, based off of Rust ICU uh, so that there is a migration path going forward for any would-be uh, user. So we'll, uh, on the next slide, we'll show uh, briefly an example trait, which is one piece of functionality, um, or sorry, a declaration of an interface for a piece of functionality. In this case, um, getting the correct uh, plural form for a given locale. On the left-hand side, you see a Rust declaration, which you know kind of logically maps into the equivalent uh, JavaScript API. And the constraints here are fairly loose. So for example, for a locale on the right-hand side, is only required that it can be displayed somewhere. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. And this is a sample implementation of plural rules. So this is like, you know, all the machinery of the Rust IC library is hidden. And this, you know, screen full of text is what remains for the compatibility layer, which we think is a good uh, trade-off. And then of course, you know, if you want to uh, migrate to a different library, you're free to provide an implementation uh, which is backed by different code. And that's it. And that's about it. So that's the end of the presentation. The key takeaways here are ICU for C is now usable from Rust. Uh, we did it because Fuchsia, the operating system needed it. It's fairly complete, but not quite there. You can help. There's an easy migration route via ECMA 402 from ICU from Rust ICU to potential future Rust uh, Unicode libraries. And uh, as we mentioned a couple of times, ICU for X is up and coming. You can also check that out. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have, I don't know if we have multiple mi microphones. We can probably just hand around the microphone. I will walk yeah. to Shane in the room. Um, hi, Philip and Constantine. Thanks for the presentation. I was, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about the ECMA 402 traits, um, which, uh, which allows um, easy migration between REST ICU and IC4X. I was wondering, um, if you've uh, done any work or have any plans or ideas about um, a, uh, for example, a compatibility test suite. I've been getting several questions this week about 
how about whether ICU for X and ICU for C or, you know, when you swap one out for the other, what are the behavior differences and things? And I was wondering, I was thinking ECMO 402 traits would be a really good way to do that. And I was wondering if that's something that you've considered um, or if you have any plans to, to do something like that. So I, I can answer this one. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, thanks for the question, Shane. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very uh, necessary part of uh, the guarantees that these various libraries make, uh, we would be looking forward to uh, such a suite. Uh, you know, we, we haven't made any uh, specific move just yet because I, I think it de really depends on uh, the user needs. Uh, but if we wanted to make uh, strong guarantees, it's definitely something that we've considered. And as you might know, uh, you know, we spent quite a bit of time discussing with, uh, uh, you know, ICU for X folks. Uh, uh, and uh, the ECMO 402 folks, yourself included, about the possibility of doing such a thing. So if there is strong interest, we'll definitely, this is something that we would want to have, I believe. Constantine, do you have something to add? Um, oh, yeah, I mean, we also happily take contributions of code. All right, thank you. Um, more questions? Anyone? There must be more questions than that. I don't know. They're all either sleepy or shy. Um, yes. So that's okay. Chira is actually raising oh. his hand. Yes. So, so with the development of that CXX.RS, uh, how relevant is the library, and like, is are you going to keep? maintaining it or switching to something else in the future? Uh, you mentioned um, C++ bindings and right. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the tooling in Rust has seen uh, you know, tremendous development over the time that Rust ICU existed. Uh, our idea is that Rust ICU continues to exist uh, for everyone that has compatible needs, for example, for Fuchsia. But uh, I personally wanted to see if there is a way to make more of this surface automatically generatable. So CXX exists, but there are, you know, for us, at least unknown limitations, it's not quite clear uh, how far it can go in terms of automating everything. Uh, but if it's possible, that's a route we would take. So ideally, you know, assume that all the tooling is in place Rust ICU would be automatically generated and continue to be automatically generated uh, just by using these uh, these tools. So Rust ICU will continue to exist, although uh, the landscape around who exactly needs to use it might change, uh, as you might expect. And you know, as as tooling becomes more available and as other libraries are being developed. Um, and just a couple other points. We haven't actually had a chance to test out CXX on ICU, so we don't know how well it works, but there could well be that there are um, quirks in the use of C++ because there are so many different ways to use C++ that something will not quite work. Um, and the other part is uh, using IC, uh, CXX does require quite a bit of work to, to set it up to adapt a C++ library. So in, even in the future, uh, if we do end up using CXX, I think Rust IC would still be useful as the library that did all that wrapping and took care of it for future users. Yeah, it, uh, it turns out that actually making this usable is quite a lot of work. And you know, I'm, I'm personally very happy that we've been able to do this for, you know, for us, but also for all of you if you need it. All right, thank you. Do we have, yes, we have one more question. I'm, I have a feeling that this is a discussion among Googlers. This is Elango asking. Just a moment. Um, yeah, so I was curious, um, when you were talking about the ECMO 42 traits, um, just to put a fine point on it, have you already taken the Fuchsia code that directly depends on Rust ICU and replaced those direct dependencies with uh, the ECMO 402 traits? Uh, so uh, not just yet. 
not just yet. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, we, we will be doing this uh, once specific need arises. So th this is, uh, let's say, uh, 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 so the Rust, I, the ECMO 402 implementation was specifically uh, to provide this migration path for would be users. And as for, you know, uh, discussion of, uh, among Googlers, I think that uh, one of the reasons is there is very keen interest in the internationalization uh, be, uh, in, uh, matters uh, with Googlers specifically. So that, that's why you know we have we have people who uh, who are actively looking at this. So uh, thank you very much for your interest. Where we planted people in the audience. That's the other. <laughs> yes, yes, you planted a lot of friends and colleagues in the, in the audience. We have time for one more question, if there's one quick one, yes. Just a moment, microphone is working. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, so I have, so I support a lot of teams that write in Go. Um, and so, you know, you've already identified a couple of challenges that you faced uh, binding ICU for C into Rust. I was curious if you had any additional advice uh, if I needed to <laughs> have ICU in Go, uh, would, what would you recommend to s start going about that approach? Or is there already a library that you're aware of that would help with that? So I'm not aware of, about specifically Go bindings. I know they're they're usually somewhat involved. I think I've seen fragments of code. I'm, I don't remember seeing a specific uh, support uh, for ICU in Go. Uh, on the upside, I think there's on, on the uh, Unicode org website, there is a page that lists all the existing uh, bindings for ICU. You might want to consult there to see if uh, there is some work involved in Go. Uh, so we haven't uh, really thought in the Go direction because uh, very pragmatically, Fuchsia happens to use many languages, but not Go for, for Fuchsia binaries. So we haven't really looked into that, but I'm, I'm aware of the uh, subtleties uh, generally of, of uh, doing FFI in Go. So I, I hear uh, I, I hear you, it's just I don't have a canned answer, really. I, I can just point you in some direction and maybe it works out for you. Uh, Constantine, do you want something to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that th there's a good chance that you would need to do something similar, which is start with a low-level API and then write Go-friendly wrappers around it to provide better uh, memory safety and memory management and so on. Okay, thank you very much, Philip and Constantine. Uh, I think we can give you a nice round of applause here. All right, thank you very much, and thanks thank for the organizers for accommodating uh, this presentation. And, uh, you know, it was nice to hear familiar voices, and uh, thank you again for attending. Yes, thanks for a great talk. And everyone, please remember the speaker evaluations. <laughs>